I believe we actually ready to start. So whoever just joined, a uh, warm welcome. I'm Federica, part of the DocCity team, and we're just about to start our webinar. Uh, we will be talking about migration and climate change, and we are talking about this very important topic with uh, Webster University Geneva. And I'm just going to introduce very briefly our panelists. We have Tina, Martina, Julia, and William connected. I just really don't want to steal much time. I can see, well, in the slide, uh, very, very brief information, but I actually wanted to ask our panelists if they would like to briefly introduce themselves to all of you guys. Maybe we could start with Dina, and it's my pleasure to leave you the floor, and I'm just going to ask then Julia and Martina to do the same after. Thank you. Thank you, Federica. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone uh, across the world. That's uh, so impressive uh, to see all these names and all these locations appearing. So uh, uh, my name is Dina Ionesco, and my name, it's already a migrant name because initially it was Ionescu and it got Frenchized in Ionesco uh, when I moved from Romania as a child running away from the dictatorship to, to France. And I mentioned this, though it's quite personal, because I think that's at the heart of uh, my interest and commitment to migration issues. Uh, it drives my, my, my work and I had the chance to enter in 2004 in the International Organization for Migration, IOM, to work on sustainable development and migration issues and slowly had the chance to move into much more the environment, climate change and migration, a whole uh, story which I got totally passionate about. Um, I just finished my function as the head of the, of the division in uh, last uh, August. I'm now uh, in the process of having new functions that are being finalized and also I engaged in, in collaboration with Webster University. Uh, hence also my presence today uh, connected to the to the future uh, master degree that is also introduced today. But I have an international background and very much into policies and a strong focus on migration with a climate uh, twist to it. Thank you, Federica. Thank you, Dina. I'm going to ask Julia actually the same question. So if you'd like to introduce yourself to us, thank you. Sure, Federica, thank you so much. And I want to say, of course, thanks again uh, to Webster University and to you for organizing this event and also to uh, Dina and, and Martina and William for joining me today. Um, very excited to be here to especially speak to students, as I understand many of the participants are, are students. And as a student and early career researcher myself, I'm, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to exchange. Um, so uh, my name is Julia Blocher. I'm a researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research and president of the International Youth Federation. And like Dina, I'm also a migrant. I um, am from the United States, as you may be able to tell from my accent. Um, but I grew up in Geneva as a child and spent a lot of time traveling around um, different parts of Europe, uh, mainly for my for my own studies. Um, and within that, uh, as a climate change activist for over a decade now, um, while I was studying in my master's, I began taking classes on human rights and, uh, and refugee law and international law. And that was when it really hit me like a ton of bricks that the impacts of climate change are not only on the physical environment, but also on communities and people and their ability to enjoy a safe and dignified life. So I began also working on the issue of um, the linkages between climate change and human mobility, uh, which I continue to do now. And now more specifically, uh, the role of youth in that, because very often young people who are di disproportionately affected. So thanks again for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Gila. And now we start, it's Martina Stern. Welcome, Martina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me and for organizing this um, very interesting event on such an important topic. Um, so yeah, I'm Martina. I 
I'm currently a policy and program assistant at IOM, as a UN uh, um, uh, agents for immigration. And uh, I was previously an intern at IOM in, in Geneva uh, in the division focusing on migration, environment, and climate change. Uh, um, I'm also an alumni. Um, uh, uh, yeah, previous student, uh, I was a student in uh, international um, in relations uh, at Webster University. So um, happy to to be back uh, contributing to to an event organized by my ex university, and um, yeah, I <laughs> I don't want to take too long, but uh, my interest in uh, migration, environment, and climate change was more of a gradual process, uh, and I, I started with the being interested in, in migration um, by volunteering with migrants and refugees uh, when I moved to Geneva. Uh, and, and that was a very important experience. I think it, it really, uh, yeah, helped me, it, you know, exposed me to such, you know, horrifying stories but also stories of hope and uh opportunities and dreams and um and then i had the chance to attend a presentation by actually iom uh migration environment climate change division on the linkages between uh migration and the environment and and that really sparked a lot of questions in me and um and then yeah I started researching more and more and that's how I ended up kind of yeah um uh, working more in, in that area and being yeah that's the origin of my interest let's say <laughs> but thank you for giving me the floor Thank you, thank you. And as you can see, we also have William and will be available actually to answer any sort of question that you might have. You notice in the chat, there is also a master degree that uh, we will be talking about a little bit uh, during the presentation. But in case you have any question while the presentation is going, please uh, feel free and William will be also available to answer any sort of questions. So actually starting uh, to go a little bit deeper into our topic, um, again, I wanted to thank our speakers for um, introducing themselves. And you know, we understand that from the introduction, you actually bring different perspectives. So we've heard about policymaking, international advocacy, a more operational also aspect. So we actually wanted to ask each of you uh, why you have engaged on these topics within this nexus of migration and climate change. So, you know, wanted to know a little bit more about your passion, your experience. Maybe we could start with Dina, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Federica. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, to, to see that for me, uh, I started working on development issues with another international organization, with the OECD that it's based in Paris and deals with policies for, for better policies, for uh, better results. And then I moved to IOM, uh, that it's a very hands-on and very action-oriented, very operational organization as well. And then, um, I, I really thought that today in our contemporary world, when I, when I started working on migration around 2004, uh, it was so bizarre that one of the key drivers of migration was a bit hidden still and not so much talked about. And this is the environmental drivers, understanding the degradation of the environment, issues of resources, such as water resources and impacts on human mobility, understanding really issues on the very long term, like extreme heat and where climate change impacts uh, are driving, for instance, such different phenomena, desertification, not enough water or floods, too much water, or change in the oceans and acidification. So the, the wide range of hazards 
and of issues of environmental dimension uh, were very often invisible. And then what was missing in my view as well was the connection between the environment and other areas, um, demography, jobs, uh, employment issues, urban issues, food issues. So I think for me, what, what was very clear was that we cannot today speak of migration and human mobility and displacement dynamics and just forget the environment and just forget the impacts of climate change. So um, I had the chance to be in the organization at the moment where uh, there was really an understanding of this and a will to put it forward strongly. So I had the chance to be in this generation in IOM that really led the change um, of giving visibility to environmental and climate change uh, issues in connection to human mobility. So I think that that's, for me, two key issues. I also call this the double sensitivity challenge. It's very complicated to work on very political issues such as migration and on very complex uh, and sensitive still issues around climate change. So it's almost a bit crazy, I think, to decide to really focus on migration and climate change, the double sensitivity uh, challenge. But I think it's a must. <laughs> it's a must. You cannot speak of migration and ignore this dimension. So that's at the heart of my engagement. And I, I, I've been working in an intergovernmental organization. So really with member states, with states in partnership with the academia, with the civil society, with researchers, with artists. But the focus has also been in changing the narrative around migration to, to see the tragedy of people being displaced by disaster and climate change, but to see also the beauty and the opportunities and the positive um, dimensions of, for instance, migrants who contribute to climate action. So I had, this is my approach, an intergovernmental organization, a lot of work on defining uh, data and evidence, a lot of partnership work and a lot of work at policy level, but then by it's, it's being operationalized by the organization. Thank you so much, Dina. Actually, we'd like to ask the same question to Julia and Martina because each of you actually brings to the table a different perspective. Maybe Martina, you would like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I might have anticipated a bit this question in my previous, um, in my introduction, but uh, so I, um, well, decided to engage in um, MEP because, I mean, kind of a, a, as a consequence of me engaging in immigration firsthand. Uh, and because I started to realize, as Dina was saying, the interconnectedness uh, of, of things and how in a, there's no not really one driver of migration. We cannot separate um drivers and and I, I felt like this aspect this driving force was very often neglected um and you know now yeah we're seeing this coming up more and more uh in international debates and um in the media but still very often i i think it's um it, it polarizes, it's very politicized, and uh, it, we tend to associate it to uh, extreme cases. So uh, we tend to talk about, um, you know, uh, climate refugees, and uh, we still don't get, you know, the breadth of, uh, of, of the scope of, of migration. I mean, that it, it's not... Um, just about the extreme cases it's such a wide spectrum and and so i think that and it starts in my i started in my like very you know small environment in my when i was at a university uh when i was volunteering even my own family uh, you know trying to raise awareness about about this that you know it's not like people are gonna start invading us uh 
from countries affected by climate change. We're not talking about forced displacement only, but this is about you know opportunities and it's much more. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's. I don't know if it, I answered your question, but <laughs> I went to be on, you on a tangent. But, um... no, 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 no. <laughs> you, 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 absolutely, you absolutely did. And as we anticipated, it's actually great to see that all of you are giving us a different perspective and we really appreciate that. And Julia, we wanted to ask a similar question to you. So we're really, what made you engaged on this topic? Yes, thank you, Federica. Um, so as mentioned before, I also um, kind of bridged into this topic from my role as a climate change activist, where before uh, connecting climate change to human mobility was, um, was very mainstream. Um, and uh, I was engaged into this topic through, through my master's program and master's thesis. Um, and I really started my career at the UN Refugee Agency at a time where uh, the discussion on whether or not UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, would be in a position to protect people who are displaced uh, as a result of um, natural hazard-induced disasters, whether internally inside of their own countries, which as we know is the vast majority of people displaced by disasters, or if there was ways to address protection gaps for people who may leave their countries. Um, this debate has very much evolved since then, and uh, and I think today we have a rather uh, consistent consensus amongst experts that most people stay within their home country, and those that cross is a minority, but would not be considered refugees in the sense of the UN Refugee Convention. Um, however, there's a lot of uh, discussion on how we could protect those people who do cross borders as well as those who stay within. And this is something that is actively discussed within the UNFCCC, UNFCCC um, largely within the framework of uh, loss and damage, but um, is also really a topic that surrounds this um, uh, UNFCCC negotiations. Um, so I wanted to learn more about this topic. So I went back to school and started a PhD on this. Um, and through my field work in um, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the Pacific, in Papua New Guinea and in Fiji, um, and also working with the International Organization for Migration, IOM, uh, I came to the realization that uh, the people who are most affected by climate change are also those who had the least to do with creating the problem in the first place. And by that, I mean, communities in the Pacific, for example, that are rapidly losing the ability to remain on their ancestral land because of sea level rise and salinization and wave related flooding, as well as uh, young people who are in a generation now coming into working age, um, having contributed very little to uh, global emissions that drive climate change, and yet looking at a future uh, of having to deal with the impacts that we're already feeling now. Um, so this is how my career trajectory brought me here um, and why I joined the International Youth Federation and then um, and thankfully have become the president and am driving uh, our role in bringing this issue to COP26 in Glasgow, uh, working with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network of the UN on, on this issue and trying to bring voices of young people, especially those who are affected by climate change to the negotiators and also to um, practitioners in, in within these conversations. So I hope that that makes sense. Thank you so much. For <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Actually, uh, Martina was mentioning the media. You just mentioned the COP26 Glasgow. I mean, definitely, I believe all of you involved into these issues have your own thoughts and ideas, but there is a lot of hype about these events. So I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, you introduced also yourself as a researcher. So I wanted to ask a little bit about your perspective on this. So do you believe that for policymaker is actually clear, the link between migration and climate change, and what do you believe are the expectation on different sides? So what do you think should be the political priorities for 
such a big gathering. Thank you. Yeah, happy to, to comment on that. But of course, when it comes to uh, governmental uh, thoughts, maybe Dina is also very well placed to, to answer the question. Um, but it is interesting, I think, to see the level of ambition and energy of policymakers going into the COP this year as compared to others. Um, and uh, of course, it's difficult to really get into the minds of negotiators, especially considering the differences of opinions and positions between them is, um, is, is so vast and diverse. So what I think is, is an interesting way to, to consider this is through the um, summary from the chair that was recently published in the UNFCCC website, which is a summary of discussions amongst ministers in the pre-conference uh, ahead of the COP26, which was held in Milan last month. Uh, and what I found really interesting about this um, was, first of all, that they really highlight, as I think they should, um, the role of youth and the engagement of youth. Um, as you may know, before this, um, or actually in, in tandem with this pre-conference in Milano, there was a so-called so Youth COP, um, Youth for Climate Driving Ambition event, um, at which uh, almost 400 young people from 186 countries discussed what they would want governmental officials to focus on at the COP. Um, and they focused on youth driving ambition, sustainable recovery, engaging NGOs, um, and also the expectations of, of youth. So um, after receiving this information from, from the youth, the ministers at this pre-conference discussed a number of, of important issues. And I can't highlight all of them, but I did want to just highlight a few um, that all kind of come under what I would think of as a heading of um, closing the gap between the current trajectory that the world is on and the commitments made in the Paris Agreement. And at the same time, closing the gap between the trajectory that those commitments would put us on and what the science actually says uh, the trajectory that we should be on in order to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So as, as we know, the difference between 1.5 degrees warming and two or three or even four degrees warming, which is, is still a possibility given our current trajectory is night and day. If we were to exceed two, two degrees warming with respect to pre-industrial levels, we would be living in a world that, that humans simply did not succeed in previously. We didn't uh, evolve in this type of um, environment. So in order to rebalance the trajectories that we're on, um, the ministers in this, in this meeting and also which, what is relayed in this summary um, was the need to uh, go back to the science and, and look at how can we be on the correct goal, the pathway to achieve the 1.5 degree temperature goal. Uh, emphasize also that countries that have not developed nationally determined contributions or national adaptation plans should do so. Um, and importantly, uh, they discussed the completion of the Paris rule book, which would be addressing the kind of lack of transparency of the reporting and, and follow-up uh, on commitments made in the Paris Agreement. And then what I think is very important that youth also mentioned um, for this conversation is the issue of loss and damage and how to really now go from understanding the issue of loss and damage to taking action on it. Um, so I do think that amongst uh, government officials in general, but especially amongst the, the negotiators at these um, climate conferences, that the understanding of the links between climate change and, and migration and displacement is, is, um, is quite high. But of course, each country has a different experience of it. Um, countries from maybe small island states in the Pacific, for them, it's truly an existential question that in a matter of decades, people may not be able to adapt in place um, where they have been living for generations any longer. That's a very different understanding of the issue um, or, the, or understanding of the urgency of the issue uh, than other countries that may not be experiencing similar effects, uh, or at least not yet. Um, so I think that 
again, there, there is a gap between where we are and what, what the science says. And this is also true for the issue of climate change and human mobility. Um, but it's really encouraging to me to see loss and damage arrest, addressed directly in this chair's summary, which means that there's a growing awareness and a growing understanding. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking so much time. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, well, uh, when you actually were um, answering the question, you also mentioned that Dina has some experience uh, into this. So I wanted actually to take advantage of asking you, Dina. I mean, you're very familiar with the aspect of long term policy making and more technical aspect of this negotiation. So I wanted to ask what are the main issues at hand? So what kind of topics are actually covered? Yes, thank you. So uh, it, it takes time indeed to, to, it's a very strange experience to go to the negotiations and to the COPs. And in fact, very often you are not part of the negotiations. And, and there is also a gap sometimes between the negotiators and everything that goes on around the COPs. But I think what it's extremely interesting is to, to, to see where we stand today, looking just slightly back. Uh, so there have been uh, 16 climate conferences without any mention of migration. And migration came uh, through the, the push of some champion countries, in particular, as, as Julia mentioned, also countries very vulnerable to climate change, like small island states. And it was pushed also by a whole community of practice that um, was made of researcher, policymaker, international organizations such as IOM, um, where the, the, the idea was also to bring the social dimension of climate change. So it's not just migration uh, issues, but also health and most importantly, human rights issues in the debate. So to, to bring uh, issues, uh, the, the human uh, dimension into the scientific dimension. And I think migrants are a bit the, the, the face, the, the, the image, the visible part of, of this social dimension and human dimension of climate change. Uh, so in a way, speaking of migration facilitates a broader um, uh, set of issues around social and human dimension and climate change. So there were 16 COPs with no mention of migration. And I'm calling this, in fact, three stages in the COPs around migration that can explain where we stand today. The first, uh, the first phase is the ab first A. It's A for absence, unfortunately. Uh, the second phase was uh, A for anchorage. So after 15 COPs, I think we, we really have a, an advance in terms of anchoring human mobility issues in the negotiated text. So you have Cancun text on adaptation, then you had the Warsaw mechanism on loss and damage that looked then at human mobility from uh, uh, the loss and damage perspective. And then the Paris Agreement recognized the migrants' uh, first like migrants rights in its preamble and established a task force on displacement under this executive committee of the Warsaw Mechanism on Loss and Damage. And I had the chance to be in this task force since 2016 till 2021. There are 13 members in the task force from international organization and also all the parts of, uh, of um, uh, groups such as the least developed countries or the adaptation group. And also they are led by by states, of course, under the executive committee on the Warsaw Mechanism. So this was uh, the time of anchorage was to negotiate text that speaks of migration. And it's the text at the Paris Agreement, but also it's connected to what happened on the migration side with the Global Compact on Migration that recognized in turn climate issues. So you have the two sides of a coin, the migration policy recognizing climate change issues and the climate change policy recognizing migration issues. So this brings us to the third uh, uh, time of this that I very optimistically, I saw that they are pessimists and optimists, but from a very pessimist, from a very optimistic side, I call this the A for action. So we have A for absence, A for anchorage and A for action because that's what's at stake now with this COP and the COPs are a long-term process. Of course, there's one shot event and it's important one because it was moved from last year to this year. So we are behind, behind schedule. But this year, the key question are about how you 
transform this anchorage into action. And that's when you say also, what are the expectations of policymakers? I think that's the key question from many sides that we, are, we saw at IOM. What does it mean concretely to speak of migration in the context of climate change? And that's why you have so many different entry points that are key now. So to just quote a few, you have really in the task force on displacement on loss and damage, uh, issues of slow onset, issues of insurance, issues of how uh, you can invest in climate action so that there is less and fewer losses and fewer damages. So seeing migration also as part of the solution in a very uh, uh, ironic way, in a way to look at loss and damage and to, to look at migration and past of the solution. You have very concrete ways of supporting states to work on their national adaptation plans with understanding migration issues, forced displacement issues, uh, how you facilitate pathways of migration to avoid tragic forms of migration. You have very concrete capacity building uh, dimension, for instance, the Santiago network on capacity building on loss and damage, where you, it's about practitioners supporting practitioners in their activities uh, to enhance their capacities to be able to respond to the challenges of climate change. You have issues really in Glasgow on finance and how we can support countries most vulnerable to climate change to access climate finance for human mobility migration type of activities. You have a very concrete gender dimension, indigenous dimension, and then you have multiple entry points. We can speak of oceans, acidification impacts on migration on fishermen communities. You speak on desertification issues uh, or deforestation impacts on indigenous population, nomadic population, concrete issues of conflict then uh, with uh, agriculture population, and you become, again, super concrete. You can speak of ecosystem, a natural-based solution. You can speak of migrants, diasporas, facilitating their investments in water management. You can speak of clean energy being delivered to people who are displaced by uh, natural hazards, for instance, or by a floods or or uh, another event. So I think it's very important to see that there are very concrete ways to speak about migration, to look in a, also the, the, the question of resilience and to really look at migration um, in its negative force compelled dimensions and what can be done to protect and support people and enhance capacities of countries most vulnerable to climate change to respond to the challenges and to see the very positive adaptative dimension of migration, migration as part of the solution and how you can support diasporas and migrants to invest themselves as well into climate action. So I think the COP has this both uh, dimension and there is a very strong focus also on climate change and human rights, which I think it's key. It might be less obvious um, in terms of what it means, but in fact, it's the backbone. It's the, the heart of the, whole, uh, of the whole issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. Um, Julia actually was talking about um, youth engagement. Beginning of our session, we actually asked if you believe that this is important. And I believe over 80% actually said yes. So uh, we saw news from Milan a few weeks ago. So actually wanted to ask uh, Martina, um, how can younger people, students, young professional, all of the people that are actually connected today, how can we influential here on this topic? Yes, thank you, Federica. Um, well, there are many ways that uh, they can get involved. I mean, um, I would say, well, well, first you can start local. Uh, it doesn't need to, to be anything big, but... Um, if you're passionate about something, you can, you know, influence your um, environment, your social networks. So people around you, uh, just talk about this uh, with your friends, with your family. Um, I would say if you're, you know, at university doing your masters, your undergrads, just 
join a group. Uh, when I was um, a Webster, I was in a humanitarian association. I then, um, yeah, became the president. And, you know, you can do a lot uh, in your in a small context uh, and you know you can it, it's rewarding uh, because you can see the change you're making um, so you don't get too frustrated by you know aiming at changing the world but you start you start little but that you know adds up uh, so I'd say yes join um groups uh like advocacy groups inside your university you can start some if they're not already there uh volunteer at events uh if you're in geneva or any other big cities i'm i'm sure you can find opportunities to to volunteer uh in geneva yeah there are just plenty 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 there's uh international you know film festival and there are documentaries on uh the interlinkages between migration and climate change uh, at this festival as, as well um human rights watch amnesty international have all uh you know all great organizations to volunteer for and they just give you they, they all tackle some from different angles this this issue and um yeah i think just <laughs> look at around you really and um yeah like starting local i think it's it's always the best way Thank you, thank you, Martina. So we actually started Glasgow, we mentioned Milan, you actually mentioned Geneva, and you know, we are our co-host for this webinar, Web City University has a campus in Geneva. So you actually already started to mention some of the greatest activities that are around this city. I wanted to take the opportunity, maybe also to ask Dina, uh, why Geneva is considered a primary location for negotiation policy and diplomacy on climate change and migration. So if you can give us uh, a different insight and also Martina started to talk a little bit about this. Yes, thank you, Federica. I think that we, uh, Geneva, like New York, are really capitals of multilateralism. And in our contemporary time, I think multilateralism is key, uh, in particular for migration issues. What is very particular about Geneva now is that you have this hub uh, of organizations that are really uh, talking of the migration and climate change topic that it's at the heart of our discussion today. So you have the community on migration and human mobility with big agencies like the refugee, um, UNHCR, the migration agency, IOM. You have a platform on disaster displacement that it's a state-led um, uh, initiative, you have an internal displacement monitoring center that is one of the key uh, data actor on internal uh, displacement issues. You have the Red Cross and the IFRC. So you have a lot of, um, of the organization. ILO as well works a lot on migration that deal with migration and have this attachment to climate issues. And then you have the hub of all the environmental and sustainable development actors. You have the United Nations Environment uh, organization. You have the World Meteorological Organization that hosts also the key IPCC, so the, the key actor on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that gives the, the, the data and evidence on this topic. You have IUCN on ecosystems and biodiversity. You have WWF. You have the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is also a state-led initiative that brings together countries most vulnerable to climate change. Then you have um, different um, uh, waste, uh, pollution, um, uh, deforestation initiatives uh, that are also in Geneva. You have the Global Alliance on Clean Energy also in Geneva. So it's a hub for environmental players and also amazing hub of 
civil society representative, you have Zoe International, you have local associations that are environmentally focused, you have initiative of change, you have CARE, the International Institution and for uh, Institute for Sustainable Development. It's really very lively uh, community of practice. Um, and then you have, that's why I think also Webster, it's, it's ideally uh, placed. It has already this long-term connection to this international uh, uh, whole um, community that's here in Geneva. And plus, of course, you have the diplomatic representation of national states that are the multilateral uh, diplomatic missions of uh, of the states and who follow also, for instance, very importantly, uh, the Human Rights Council that also addresses this uh, dimension from its perspective. So I think it's, it's a very particular and amazing um, field uh, to, to deep dive into this topic by being connected to this international um, whole life that it's the heart beating on the on the discussion on this today. Thank you. I uh, want to just take a minute just to thank all of you for your questions. We received lots of questions, which is great. And we try to do our best to answer some of them uh, just at the end of, of the presentation. I mean, Gina, you mentioned Webster Geneva. Uh, we have also connected uh, William, Director of Admissions at Webster. And at the beginning, we also mentioned that there is a specific uh, master, is a new master, uh, migration, climate change, and environment. So we mentioned how important it is for youth to get involved uh, to students and also maybe, you know, invest into education, how it could make a difference. I wanted really just to spend a couple of minutes maybe to talk about this program, maybe who is designed for and how actually can help shaping you know, people that are interested into this uh, topic, as we can see that lots of people connected also think that is important to get involved. So maybe I don't know um, if Dean, I also I, support I of can William. Say, yes, I can us. say a few words. And of course, William, uh, please jump in. For me, I think the vision I see for this new master degree is, first of all, that these are such important issues uh, that we need to prepare a new generation of practitioners to be able to address them and that also the knowledge we have on this topic has so much grown over the last 20 15 years we are at a, such a different point that now we need very specific uh, programs to be able to address this correctly then I think the vision for it it's really a vision of cross-disciplinary approach because as soon as you speak of migration you speak of migration and something else and then here we are at the heart of this end by connecting migration and climate change. So it's cross-disciplinary. It means it's, it's a program, I think, that's meant for people who are environmentalists as much as social uh, policy uh, people. About, it's for people who work on migration, people who work on sustainability, very concrete technical issues. I think it goes across uh, social issues, even health. I saw some questions were also looking at the impact of COVID on all this whole topic. And I think it's something that it's at the heart of our reflection. How, what do we learn from this uh, pandemic as well uh, in terms of this very complex topic and that we need to address coherently issues. So I think it's also very important for human rights practitioners to be able to be trained in this particularly. So there's this vision of the multidisciplinarity, the vision of being time that it's needed now because of the way we advance on this topic. And lastly, for me, I think what's key is to have a program that's connected to international Geneva that's connected to professional life, that it's connected to the discussions that are being held at the professional international level. So that people arrive already prepared and connected through internships, through exchanges, through a permanent ping pong between the professional world and the academic world. So to, to have it like a very nice uh, circle virtuous circle where the, this evidence fits in 
the professional world and then what we learn from the professional world in terms of policy and operation feeds back into this academic uh, education and, and, and knowledge. Thank you, William. I just wanted to ask if you wanted to add a couple of words before jumping into the Q&A. And again, thank you all for all of your questions. They're super interested. Thank you so much. I think just on behalf of the university, thank you again to Julia, Martina, and Dina for joining us uh, and for hosting Federica. For all of you who asked questions in the Q&A, I don't want to take too much time because I saw some fantastic questions. And it just reminds me that there's a need for this kind of program uh, that provides uh, you know, knowledge about the policy making process and so forth, but also about the science, uh, where to get information, how to connect to the experts. Um, and as Dina mentioned, we need a new generation of people who are graduating from university prepared to take leadership positions, even as younger people in these organizations, in some of the movements that are happening, whether it's at the World Health Organization, whether it's in any of these uh, different organizations in Geneva or even beyond in the regions, as Martina said, there's so much that can be done locally. So I won't, I won't take more other than to thank everyone for their interest in the topic. Um, I also want to encourage Julia, if you have an opportunity, uh, Martina did answer the question about how young people can get involved. And I imagine you have something to say about that too. So I wanna make sure Julia has a chance to chime in there. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, be sure that all of those who joined today have access to the website for more details. Thank you, Julia, leave me the floor to answer these very important questions that we face together. Yes, thank you for, for throwing it back to me. I really do appreciate it. And I, uh, I absolutely agree with um, what Martina said, and I, I, which is in essentially start local. And I think that this is what is um, very often a successful path for, for youth who want to be involved in issues that are important to them and, and affect them in their communities. Um, I find in general that if, if you are engaged in an issue that you feel passionate about and that also affects you personally, uh, your long-term impact tends to be um, tends to be greater. Um, also, I can encourage everyone to uh, check out what we're doing at the International Youth Federation. Um, we are a network of youth organizations um, and work in uh, 50 countries around the world. And our goal really is to amplify the work of youth that they're already involved in. So we do uh, some projects, but we also are really trying to serve as a platform for youth and, and the contributions that they already make. Um, and I think this is also our goal for being a part of, of the COP and also, of course, webinars like this um, is to help connect people to uh, young people, to other young people that are doing similar work um, so that they can uh, multiply their impact, uh, connect to funders, raise awareness, raise visibility for their issues, um, and, and make a, a bigger impact than, than they can um, alone in most cases. Um, but I do think um, it's, it's very important that youth continue to be involved in these issues. Of course, I think the climate change issue in particular is something that young people are very engaged in because it so impacts them, them and their futures. But it is also uh, in a very optimistic sense that, that I feel an issue that youth really have a huge amount of leverage and are really taken very seriously um, in, in the governmental discussions in their own countries and also in the international forums that are provided like through the UNFCCC. So there's, um, youth delegations at the COP. There's a lot of work going on through the UN um, Major Group for Children and Youth. There's the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, which the International Youth Federation is also part of. There are a lot of ways for youth to break through on this issue and governments in fact want to hear from youth on this issue. Um, so I really encourage young people to uh, be on their social networks to maintain their optimism because that's what a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of governments also want to hear from young people is, is that they're hopeful and feel that there's more to be done and are willing to, to put in the work and push others to put in, put in the work as well. So um, I encourage everyone to 
again, check us out at the International Youth Federation. Get on your social media networks during the COP. They're already now um, and really let your voices be heard. Thank you. And um, actually, uh, Dina just posted on the chat. I'm just going to add a comment. There is um, a portal that you can actually find lots of information on this topic. So thank you so much, Dina, for sharing this with us. Um, actually, now is really time to answer to some of your questions. Thanks again. I can see Julia already started to answer to some, which is great. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the questions is about expectations. So we talked a little bit uh, during our session. So is there an effort to establish a uniform international code and regulation for migrants or is it actually an unrealistic expectation? I don't know, I'd like to go first, maybe Dina, I can see you're nodding if you'd like to start. And of course, Julia Martina, if you'd like to add anything for free. Yes, I think, uh, and I will post also a link to, to that can help also responding to this question. I think it's uh, uh, very important to, to, to see that um, over the past year, there has been a lot of discussion at international level about this. And I think in my view, the global compact on migration, on regular safe and orderly migration, it's one of the responses of the international community to uh, to having a more unified approach. You have all the very interesting initiative like the Nansen Protection Agenda that was adopted in 2015, looking at protection gaps for people crossing a border because of disaster displacement or climate change longer term impacts. I think from everything I saw from my work with IOM at policy level, there is no one single one uh, solution. I think there is a wide variety of responses to this question uh, and, and the issues around uh, migration in the context of climate change. So uh, one single unified response, I don't think it's necessary the response and I don't think it will happen as such. You have a myriad of different approaches. And um, if you read the Global Compact on Migration, it provides very advanced language on different ways uh, you have responses through uh, protection uh, for visa issues, um, entry and stay, protection that's temporary, humanitarian protection. You have um, pro like promoting regular pathways. You have actions that has to be have to be taken at regional level. For instance, regional free movement protocols to better factor in uh, my environmental and disaster and climate change dimensions. I really think that we cannot expect one single response. And um, if we focus too much also on this climate refugee kind of approach, I think we end up sometimes with the opposite of what we are really willing to do. We might end up by boxing people in very narrow categories instead of having a, a much wider innovative vision of uh, how to make migration a choice, how to make it dignified, how to make it regular, how to make it uh, work for people. So for me, yes, not one single response for sure. And I think difficulties to have a unified one uh, response at policy level, but loads of different possible approaches and solutions that can be promoted through dialogues and through collaboration and through regional uh, approaches in particular. Thank you. Um, I could see that Julia was actually answering a question, so I wanted to ask you, so it could be useful for all of us. There is a question about, um, so um, someone from South Asia asking um, if you believe that uh, you see the future of South Asia in terms of climate based on migrants and refugees. So what you can actually try to predict in terms of this. To me for this one? So I was so yes, answering. Because I saw you actually were starting to type, so I thought it just took the occasion to read it to you. Yes, absolutely. So the the um question from I think Fatima um was about the, the how Asia in general is very often put up as the um the, the region of the world that is most affected by um, by climate change, um, which is, I think, related to 
early reports and especially in the media about sea level rise in small island states and how this affects uh, the territorial existence of this country. Um, but I also wanted to add to this that um, for some years now, um, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which again is a Geneva-based um, think tank, uh, South Asia or Asia, the Asia Pacific region overall um, is usually the region with the highest number of people displaced by natural hazard induced disasters um, every year. So by that, I mean people who are fleeing their homes from because of cyclones and, and flooding and, and things like that. And um, last year alone, that was more than 12 million people just in the East Asia and Pacific region. So it's very much the case that this region is disproportionately affected um, for a number of reasons that are um, not just because of um, poverty and other uh, reasons why people are vulnerable in this region, but also um, biophysical regions, reasons. There's the um, Pacific Rift. There's a number of reasons why cyclones are, are very severe in this region um, and, and other uh, things like that. Um, also because of population growth in the region and the low average age of many of these countries, it's likely that this will continue, that this region will still be disproportionately affected by disasters um, in the future, but we have higher population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so maybe uh, in the future this will, this will no longer be the case. Um, but that's just about people who are displaced by disasters. I also wanted to point out that when it comes to migration, um, of course, we don't have really good information about uh, people who are migrating in this region because of climate change impacts, but we're doing more and more to understand this. Um, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research, where, where I work, uh, we recently published a report that highlights uh, mobility in the Philippines and in the Pacific region, um, which is relatively understudied as compared to some other, other, country, other areas of the world. Um, and what we found is, is that a lot of people are migrating um, towards urban areas because of drought and other reasons why agricultural activities are, are failing. Um, and so we, we think that this will uh, be also an important issue in the future. But again, we don't have very, we need to improve the data and research on this. Um, but I would point uh, Fatima and others to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center <clears throat> and also to a re uh, recent report of the Asian Development Bank that addresses uh, exactly this topic of climate change related migration in Asia and the Pacific. So I'll put that link in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, could Dilonga just ask us, so perceive that we as human are very financial driven and how to engage government, especially in the sub-Sahara countries to take the necessary action when they don't see any fast financial return so, of course, it's very hard to try to give an answer, but what is your opinion on this in terms of like how to engage the government to actually take an action, although there might not be a return in terms of money or investment? Dina or Martina, if you want just to help us answer, as, as I said, it's not easy. Yes, it's a tough question and there are loads of tough questions because in fact, this is a very complicated and complex topic. And it brings me back also to the question of being pessimistic or optimistic. You know, we can look at this both ways uh, because humanity is capable of the best and of the worst. And we have to go ahead even with this topic by accepting this. And a lot of the questions and the question you also asked are very difficult questions because they are long-term change issues and they touch upon inequalities, uh, poverty, uh, lack of human rights, um, respect, questions of corruption. These are very complex uh, issues that of course we cannot just solve and address like this. I think it's, it's, it's not a call nevertheless to stop doing, it's the contrary. I think all this realizing all these difficulties only can push us 
to try to to once again educate and, and train people to be able to address the complexity. And for me, as soon as you work on climate change and migration issues, you need to be very nuanced and to understand the complexities and to look at this uh, wide range of solutions that I mentioned before. So I think there are solutions that are about more youth investment, more civil society investment, uh, working more closely with the private sector, working closely with chambers of commerce, um, investing in capacities, for instance, to support countries that are uh, in difficulty to access the funds, but then to with <laughs> find very strong uh, guards of how the money is then used and evaluation of the projects and of the programs. These are very complex issues, but my, my, my call is not to believe that we can't do anything and to not look at it. I think it, you can't look at it like a huge mountain as the Everest and got on the top of the Everest from the first moment. You have to do camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, camp five. I don't know how many you have to get up the Everest or the Mont Blanc, we have the Mont Blanc uh, behind us in, in the picture. So I think it's about being realistic that you won't cope with the whole thing, but you will have to work step by step, grade by grade, brick by brick, block by block into creating solutions. And um, yeah, that's what I, I would say. Then for Sub-Saharan Africa, there are very particular difficult challenges. We have awful projections in terms of extreme heat and desertification. We have issues around the use of resources. And I think if you want to look, for instance, in, in IOM's programs in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa, in, um, in the region where there are connections between migration and climate change, you will find also very different programs. Some are for returnees to return back with land management programs. Some are for uh, support to nomadic populations so that they can continue to move with their herds. Some will be about investment in the environment to curve the desertification trends and to support people to maintain their livelihoods. Other about the protection of people being displaced. Each time you will find a, a range uh, of activities and, and projects that address bits and pieces of this major big Everest of issues. Thank you. So we actually coming toward the end of our Perhaps evening. That might be, uh, yes, I was just going to add that perhaps that was a good point that Tina raised, that it feels like an Everest or a mountain of issues. This is a good reason why we're encouraging people to think about going back for additional learning, whether it's for a short course, for a degree program, for any training that's available, simply because the more you're able to learn and acquire the skills and competencies and awareness of how it affects the type of work you're doing, whether you're in engineering, whether you're in uh, politics, whether you're um, an advocate who's doing communications work. Uh, that's the, the kind of uh, aspiration we have for the new master's degree is that uh, people will be joining us from many different backgrounds, from many academic trainings. So it's not a program only for people who studied political science or international relations, but rather to bring people together from healthcare, from science backgrounds, from political science, um, from communications, because everybody has a role to play in putting together what would be the right kind of campaign for change. Thank you, William. And I totally agree. I mean, investing in education and really could, could make a difference. And as mentioned, we will be sending you an email after this event. You will have all the information related to this master program. You can, you know, reach out. There will be a link to the website. But uh, before um, closing the session, I really wanted to thank our speakers. And there are a lot of questions that maybe we didn't have time to get through today, but I wanted to ask Julia, Dina, Martina, and also William, if there was something else that you wanted to add, like an encouragement. And we said, you know, some of the, some of the people that are listening were very optimistic or pessimistic, but just wanted to ask, you know, final words, something that can take back from this session today. Maybe starting with Martina, and then I'm going to ask each of you if you wanted to add anything to what has been said. Thank you. Uh, 
Oh, it's really hard to to summarize. I think this <laughs> discussion in in one message, but um, I think if there's one thing, uh, I'm probably like speaking to other like students and young people. I would say um, think. Um, Try to see connections between things. Uh, do as many experiences as you can that can broaden your horizons and help you see connection between things. Because um, then I think one of the greatest problems that we have in, uh, well, in many areas is that people think in silos from their field of expertise and they don't see links. Um, between between issues and you know climate change and migration is just one example uh but i do think that the more experiences you can you can um you can make and the more you yeah you can learn about different disparate topics uh yeah that will enrich you and help you to make connections and contribute to society even more in a positive way Thank you so much, Martina. I wanted also to ask a similar thing to Julia and again, thanking her for her time for being here. Sure, thank you so much again, Federica, and also to Martina, um, Dina and William for, for joining today. Uh, yes, I think um, I would echo what was said about learning. I'm, I'm a student myself. I think it's good to keep learning throughout life, um, whether you're doing that through a uh, degree certification or something which I'm very much supportive of at IYF is peer-to-peer -peer support mechanisms and peer-to-peer -peer trainings, um, or perhaps uh, volunteer opportunities where you have experiential learning. Um, these are things that I think can, can um, help develop one personally and and then ultimately contribute to the community around you so um very happy to be in touch with anyone uh who wants to find me on <laughs> on twitter or linkedin um and continue this conversation uh later and thanks again for having me thank you julia dina your turn thank yes. you thank you and thank you also to all panelists and all uh people who attended the seminar um, from my side, I would come back to the question you posed at the beginning, maybe as the key message, it's uh, the making a difference. I think for me, it's clear that absolutely each individual can make a difference. And even working in huge organizations, you can be uh, at individual level, uh, strongly making a, di a, a difference and an impact. And for me, making a difference means so many different things. It can be being an advocate. It can be working in the private sector uh, in connection to this topic. It can be really impacting at policy level. For me, this is super concrete. I know for many people working on policies, it's not concrete at all. It's only concrete if you really help people uh, in need, for instance. But for me, I think investing into working at policy level makes a difference on the longer term, in particular in terms of migration issues. I think you can make a difference by your investing in research, working on data, working on publication. I think you can make a huge difference by working in the media on this topic and going beyond the usual narratives, going beyond uh, a caricatural approach to this very complex topic. I think you can make a difference by educating your own kids with respect for migrants and respect for the environment and for nature. So I think that's the key thing. Making a difference can take all these uh, dimensions in relation to, to the topic we discussed today. And education, of course, in my view, it's at the heart uh, of absolutely everything. Uh, education from the crash to, <laughs> to the, the PhD um, and everything in between. And that's why also I think that creating a new program on this topic, it's very uh, courageous and timely and, and uh, maybe a bit crazy, but I really believe it's, it's totally needed.
<laughs> thank you. And while thanking the UAPS University Geneva and William for giving us the opportunity really to talk about those issues, I wanted to ask William if there was anything else they wanted to add. Uh, again, just a, a big thank you to all the participants with the great questions to all of our panelists, uh, as you've done. I think it was Dina, but someone had mentioned that migrants have become the, the uh, face of the human dimension, dimension of climate change. And uh, this all brings this to light. I, I think for those who attended, all the participants, um, the world needs your talents, uh, your contributions, your motivation makes a difference. Whether you're coming at this issue thinking about marginalized communities in your home country, whether you're coming at this issue from the perspective of human rights or from the science perspective or from the perspective of um, uh, you know, being a champion for communications through social media, trying to make a difference. Uh, continue to find ways to connect, as Martina said, to engage, whether it's through studies, whether it's through sharing your passion and knowledge that you're learning along the way with people that you know, and uh, don't hesitate uh, to just follow the news and to share with people how important you believe these issues are. Um, because as Martina said, thinking about how things are connected is probably what the master's level is all about. Uh, at the bachelor level, we learn many disciplines, but at the master's level, it's very often learning how to connect those disciplines that really makes a difference. And I think it makes for fascinating careers it makes for careers that uh, ultimately have the impact to, to influence in the world. So uh, we invite you, of course, to take a closer look at our master's program, but anything you can do to advance your own interests. Uh, and Thank you. So really thanks so much for our panelists for being with us today and for all of you for being connected. Your questions were absolutely great. Uh, we will be sending out an email with some extra information. The session was recorded, so in case you know you want to watch it again, just because maybe you want to take more attention to some of the answer we provided you with, absolutely, you will have the opportunity. Once again, thanks for all. I'm just going to share in the chat a link in case you'd like to receive a certificate for attending the session. And we look forward to seeing you soon at the next live webinar of Webster University Geneva. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.